So I admit I didn't completely know all of the words in the last two, two verses. I know most of them, but I didn't know them. I couldn't bring them out of memory. But, uh, <clears throat> you know, these things happen. <clears throat> if you didn't know any of the words, uh, hopefully you got at least what the, what the band was singing. Uh, anyway, welcome back. Uh, I'm glad to see that I didn't scare too many folks off last week with my sermon on deacons and serving and, you know, uh, things like that. Um, Pastor Scott should be back in the office this on Tuesday. I believe he's act, they're back in the country, but um, probably probably uh, not in great shape because they probably I think they flew all day yesterday. So uh, just be nice. Don't call pa Pastor Scott until Tuesday morning, okay? Uh, if you need anything pastoral between now and then, hey Bruce, hey Bruce, Br Bruce, you know. Monty Python, yes, I know. Okay, but yeah, call, call one of us, and we'll handle it as best as we can. Um, <clears throat> so, we are in a series called Church Words, okay? And today's church word is church, okay? As I mentioned last week, uh, Pastor, and I, <clears throat> Pastor Scott and I agreed that to only use church words that are actually in the Bible, okay? Um... And the church, the, the word that we translate, the New Testament is translated uh, into church, is the Greek word ecclesia. Okay? Sometimes we say ecclesia, but it's actually an eta. For those of you who know Greek, it's an eta. So it has a long A sound there, so it's ecclesia. Um, and it is in the New Testament. In fact, it's in the New Testament 112 times. So it's, a, it's obviously a subject which... Uh, is, is important because it's in Scripture so often. So, um, and I admit, last week I used the Greek word diakonos in quite a bit in my sermon and the various uh, versions of diakonos um, that, that appear, you know, the verb, the different nouns, the verb. Um, <clears throat> and uh, Bruce told me that every time I used one of the Greek words, all he could think of was my big fat Greek wedding. Uh, some people are easily distracted. Um, but since ecclesia only seems to have one form other than the plural, I mean, some, it's churches sometimes, um, you won't hear that much Greek today. Uh, I just need to, you will hear some, but you won't hear as much as you did last week. Um, so what then, what then does it mean? What then does it mean? Um, I want to look at our verse today, the scripture verse I picked for today, um, since in the New Testament, uh, Matthew 16 is the first time that the word ecclesia, church, appears in the New Testament, okay? I, and so I want to, if you, if, if you have your Bibles or your Bible app, whatever, if you want to go to Matthew chapter 16, and we're going to go to verse 13, and once again, I'm reading from the English Standard Version. Uh, this is a very familiar passage uh, to most of you. Uh, it, is, uh, it is really the, you know, Jesus' declaration of starting the church. So, if we're good to go, I still see people flipping pages. The wind's not helping. All right, verse 13. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do the people say that the Son of Man himself is? Yeah. Who do they say I am? And they said, well, some say John the Baptist. And others say Elijah. And others say Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, the apostles, but who do you say that I am? Who do you say I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, Simon son of Jonah. 
For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven, and I tell you, you are Peter. Well, excitement going on here. Um, you are Peter, and on and that word, by the way, he's he, the word Peter <coughs> literally translates into a small stone. You know, something you'd skip across a lake. Okay, it's not a it's not a huge right. It's just a it's just a something you'd pick up and throw out. You know, just to make ripples in the pond. Um, he says, you are Peter, and on this rock, and this is the word Petra, which means massive, boulder, well, mountain, really. I mean, it's huge. This is a huge rock. On this huge rock, he's being punny here. On this rock, I will build my church. I will build my ecclesia. I will build my church. Then the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Good news. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound on hev in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly charged his disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. Don't tell anybody. Yet. So here's a question for you. When Jesus used the word ecclesia, here, I will, on this rock I will build my ecclesia, I will build my church. What was the picture that formed in the mind of the disciples? Okay. Uh, I can guarantee you they did not see a white church with a bell tower and a tent with people sitting outside. They certainly, um, or, you know, they never saw what our forefathers would have called a meeting house. You know, like we used, like we used to have up at the top of Oak Hill here. Um, we, did, we had a meeting house up there. Well, you don't, obviously, it's no longer there. They would not have imagined that. And certainly, I don't know if you any, how many of you have been to Europe, but the majestic cathedrals over there are impressive. Been there. I've seen quite a few of them. They're they're awesome. I don't think that was the picture that the disciples got when Jesus said, I will build my church. That's not, the, that's not what came into their mind. So what did it mean to them? Which means something, you know, something we should know and we should take to heart because it's what it should mean to us. <coughs> Excuse me. In New Testament times, the word ecclesia meant a gathering of those summoned. A gathering of the summoned. Sometimes um, an assembly of the called. Okay, that's, you can translate it both. They're the same, they're, they're kind of the same meeting. But some, sometimes uh, different people translate it slightly different. It's a gathering of the summoned. Um, in practical usage... In the in New Testament times, <clears throat> was uh, it's a it's a Greek concept. It, it was an assembly of the citizens of a city state, okay, who were be summoned to a what's known as the town agora. That's another Greek word, agora, um, which we would just call the town square, the marketplace, you know, the big central you know, the common, whatever you would want to call it. The, the citizens, the, the, the citizens of the city-state would, uh, would be summoned to the ecclesia, to the city, you know, they would, they would be the gathering, they would be, they would be summoned to the agora, they would be the ecclesia, the, uh, and there they would uh, have um, announcements would be made from the government, uh, they could have a debates about laws, they could be vote on things, um, it was an assembly of people in a specific spot. Okay? It was a, an assembly of the people in a specific spot. And so that is, the, that is the, the idea of a kind of a town meeting in an open area is really the picture that the, um, that the apostles would have gotten when, they, when Jesus established his church. 
um, we would call it a local church. Okay, that's an ecclesia. We are an ecclesia. Okay, because it, re it did refer not only to the building or the area, but it would also refer, refer to the people. But it's the idea of locality. It's, a, there's, it's in a specific spot. Um, we call it the local church as Christ has called or summoned us to meet in a specific place to conduct worship and the other necessary acts of the church, right? Sounds very congregational to me. We congregate. We get together. Locally. Um, and we know that Christ did that, you know, at 1 Corinthians 12, 18, it, you know, says God uh, builds his church, puts together the body exactly as he pleases. Okay, if you ever, if you want to know, he, where, <clears throat> you're not here by accident. God put you here whether you knew it or not. He's arranged the body the way he wants it. Now, <clears throat> in Scripture, sorry, <clears throat> lots of pollen today, sorry. The idea, in, there is the idea in the, ch in the Scripture of the church universal. I mean, in, in, in Matthew 16, he talks about my church. There's like one church there. But in reality, the word would have still meant mostly local churches. You know, um, he uses it, you know, and the New Testament uses it mostly to um, refer to a local assembly of believers. And if he means more than one, they just plural. It's churches, like the churches in Asia sometimes. It's, it's a, they'll use the plural form of church. But it's always, almost always in the New Testament, um, a local assembly of believers. And we can see what the early church was like. Uh, and this is Acts 2. Um, starting out, you know, Peter, they've had the day of Pentecost is in Acts 2. And, they, you know, and at the end of Peter's speech, 3,000 people were added to the church. Can we have a membership class? 3,000 people added to the church that day were baptized. And... Um, and uh, and, and it talks about what happened after that. They, it, and this is uh, Acts 2, uh, starting in verse 42. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. They were doing things that made people... Take notice. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. Right? No, no hoarders. Nobody, you know, it's all mine. No, all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings as distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Talk about a church serving each other. I'll go sell this property so this person can eat. So this person has a place to live, right? Think about that. Now, that's not something in our culture, is it? <laughs> but that's what the New Testament church looked like right after Pentecost. Remember last week I said that the, princ the principle of the church of Jesus Christ, you know, the, the, you know the, it's, the church is based upon members serving each other? That's what the local church does. We serve each other. If, if this sounds like part two of last week's sermon, okay. Kind of is. Not really, but it is. Okay? Because it, it fits together. It, it's, it's all the same idea. As, a, as church, we serve each other. So what does a church do? Okay? It's a question. Okay? We meet together as a church. We 
get together, we listen to some songs, we worship, we pray. We listen to Bruce, you know, give us some information. We listen to Pastor Scott, give us some, you know, a sermon. <clears throat> what, what do we do? Well, there's a couple of different lists out there. I, I did some research and, you know, I knew that, you know, what, what, what is in Scripture are we supposed to be doing as a church? <clears throat> and I found this one list that captures at least most of it. Um, some of these areas, these bullet points, I, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to spend a lot of time. I mean, I can turn this whole thing on church into a multi-week series. I'm not going to. Don't worry. Pastor Scott will be back next week. Uh... Back in back in the Exodus 34, uh, but this list captures most of it. I think it's it's a pretty good a pretty good list, pretty comprehensive. Um, and again, there's a couple of different different commentators have different lists out there. They you know they put out and so, but they're all pretty much and th these these things pretty much fall out on all of them. Number one, serve one another in love. We serve one another in love. What do you need? How can I help you? How can I serve you? How can I, how do I humble myself? How do I become that, you know, deacon, little d, deacon, uh, server for you? What do I do? How do I do that? And have that heart to want to do that. The other thing we are to do, number two here, is to equip the saints for ministry. Equip the saints for ministry, right? Um, how many of you, the day you came to Christ, the day you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, were ready to go out and give a sermon? Or were ready to event, I mean, how many, right? Right? How many of you thought, okay, I, I got, okay, oh, I can go, you know, Speak on uh, pneumatology. How many people know what pneumatology is? And it's a real word. It means the spirit. It's, it's a study of the spirit. It's, you know, something they do in the seminaries. Pneumatology. And yeah, pneumatic. It comes from the word, the wind. The idea that the spirit is the wind. It, 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 it is that word. All right? No, yeah, none of us. Right? None of us were ready. But... As, as we gather together, as we grow, as we do things, Christian Ed, we become more and more equipped in the knowledge, first of all, in the knowledge of the word, we, we become equipped to do the things that we are called to do as a church, to minister to each other, okay? Uh, your, your, you know, your church member, ha a fellow church member has an issue and they need biblical guidance. Well, can you give it? Can you give them that biblical guidance? How do I overcome? They, they're having trouble overcoming a sin, or they want to they wanna know how to pray for or counsel somebody who's having trouble. How, can you give them biblical, good biblical counsel? Well, not right away. But over time, yes. And God calls all of us to be able to be equipped. Okay? And really part of our job as the elders is to equip you. Part of what we're doing. We equip you. <clears throat> and again, some of these, uh, this, this next one kind of overlaps the first one a little bit. To care for widows, orphans, and those with physical needs. To care for the widows, the orphans, and those with physical needs. Right? Um, the church has paid mortgages. In history, rather than have one of our members lose their house because they were going through a rough time. They've bought, we've bought tanks of heating oil in the winter or propane. Physical need, we, we don't want you to freeze to death. We won't let that happen. We won't let you go homeless. That's what we do. 
Number four on the list is what we're doing now. We worship collectively. We come together as a collect. We, we, we collect each other, you know, we come in as a collection of people and we worship the Lord God Almighty. Obviously. Because who else are we going to worship? Don't answer that. Because, unfortunately, we all have idols in our heart that we do worship. Some, some of them, and unfortunately a lot of idols look good. All idols look good at some point, until you realize that you're enslaved to them. But we want to worship the Lord God. We Him here, we worship the Lord God. We, Lord, we worship the Lord Jesus Christ. We, we ask the Holy Spirit to be among us, to teach us, to show us things. The, the Holy Spirit... You know, those idol, you know, one of the things the Holy Spirit does when we worship is he shows us the idols. He drags them out of our heart and shows them, do you really want this in there? Whatever it is. He wants you to see how ugly the, your idols are. And they're in your heart. Do you want them there? We get that. Part of that is through worship. Because only he is worth worship. Not your idols. And yet we all, have, we all have them. We're all sinners. We all fall short of the glory of God. Let's stop. Number five. To read and study the scriptures. Bible study. What does the scripture say? Hey, I've never read the, uh, I've never read the book of Obadiah. What's in there? By the way, somebody told me once, it's really, it's really easy to remember Obadiah. It's, A, it's the shortest book in the Bible, just so you know that. And two, it's really the first four letters of the word. Oh, bad. Oh, bad. Yeah, that's really the message of Obadiah, you know. <laughs> it, it's really, it's uh, talking to Israel and the things they were doing that they shouldn't be doing. Um, the next one, John kind of alluded to, there's number six here, John alluded to it uh, Introducing the song, that, that hymn, to protect the gospel and the church from false teachers and deception. You know, one of the terms used for the church here on earth, for ecclesia, is the church militant. The church militant. You might have heard that term. We're in a war. The, the devil and his minions are warring against the church. We're in the middle of it, whether we like to believe it or not. We are the church mil militant. The other term, by the way, is church triumphant. And that's after you're home with the Lord. The church in heaven is the church triumphant, just in case you, as, as, a, as a little aside. But while you're here, while we're here in this church, we're worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ, we are the church militant. We need to be, re remember that we have to be soldiers ready to shoot down, ready to uh, come against um, the, the, those who would deceive <coughs> Those who would, would, would try to, to do, I'm going to talk about that more in a minute, but just, that's our job. We have to protect our church. We have to check, protect the truth of the gospel. Number seven is to provide discipleship. Okay, discipleship, I think I've mentioned it before, the word disciple and the word discipline come from the same root. The same word, really? To provide discipleship, to provide accountability. Okay, you're having trouble with this, brother. How can I help you, sister? How can I help you? Can I, you know, how we, how did you do this week with that that issue? And it's also a community. We are to provide a community where it is safe to confess our sins one to another. Okay, it's not. We're not here for show, folks. Even though I know Bruce said it's showtime. 
Not at all, really. Okay? If, if your brother or sister is struggling, in, if you're struggling in, in sin, find somebody you can trust because, and, and, and tell them what's going on and ask them to pray and help, and help you get counsel. <coughs> As a church, we are to be a safe place where that can happen. I can confess my sin and you're not going to blab it all over the place. You're not going to use it against me. If, there, if the church isn't a safe place for us to be in fellowship, to be that close to one another, where are we going to go? Where could we possibly go? And finally, the last thing on this is one that <clears throat> I think scares people the most, is to bring the story of our great Savior to the community and to the world. Evangelism. You know, how many people would agree that Jesus' story needs to be told? How many people think somebody else needs to tell it? <laughs> Not, okay, no. We, he charges us to teach, to, to tell his story, to, to, you know, to preach, to, to you know, um, there was a, one of the uh, saints that used to come to this church, um, long time ago, was, many of you know, re, would, will remember him as Wally Shortle. And he said one, something once that stuck with me in Holly, that, uh, you know, a, a, a Christian should be able to pray, preach, or die at any second. And you know what? There's a lot of wisdom in that statement. Pray, preach, or die at any second. To pray for somebody, to preach, to, to bring the word forth, to tell the story of Jesus, or to be ready to be called home at any second. So that's us. Church, discipleship, fellowship, worship, service, compassion, defending the truth of the gospel while reaching out to the lost all around us. And that's our vision as a church, right? How many people here can actually quote the vision of the First Congregational Church of Barrington? Okay. And, and, and if you don't get it quite right, I'll... Anybody? You want to try? Okay. <clears throat> we are a worshiping community of growing disciples living out Christ's love for a world. That's it. That's our vision. That's what we see ourselves being, ourselves doing. Whoops. Um, by the way, pneumatology, when the wind comes in, you know, maybe that was the spirit. Um, don't, don't take that. As a, that's, that's not gospel. Um, a worshiping community of growing disciples living out Christ's love for the world. Now, our vision is a pretty high level statement, okay? It's really not going to be, you know, how do we measure that? How do we see it? It's a pretty high level. Um, where, where it comes down to brass tacks is that word living, yeah, that phrase living out. Because <laughs> that looks like work. Because it is. <laughs> it's work. It takes work. Paul, of course, hits this head on. Um, he instructs the church at Philippi to, uh, in chapter 2, uh, church, chapter 2 uh, Philippians, he started, starting in verse 12, he says, Therefore, my beloved, talking to the church here in, in Philippi, um, we always say pi, only mathematicians say pi, the Greeks say p, all right? Just, you know, in Philippi. Um, As you have always obeyed, so now, not only in my presence, but much more in my absence, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Why the fear and trembling? Because it's God working in you. Remember that. Just be willing. Just be willing. Work it out. Your salvation, if you are saved, it means something. You're supposed to go to work. 
Let God work through you for his good pleasure. And it'll go well. It'll go well for you. We are to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. And <clears throat> we as a church are to come alongside each other, serving each other as we do this. Okay? If, I, if there's one thing I want you to pull away from today, if you don't pull away anything else, you're not alone. You're not alone. We're with you. Fellowship, the word fellowship mean, is a much deeper meaning than just friendship. It has much more to it. It's not just friendship. It's much, it's, it's a, you know, we struggle, okay, but we are not alone. The Holy Spirit uses your church members your friends, your, church, your, your other church people, to equip you, to strengthen you, to grow you, so that your efforts are pleasing to God. This becomes especially important where the, when the latest fad strikes the church. You all kind of know what I'm talking about. You know, probably the biggest one that might still be out there is the health and wealth gospel. Right. It's a fad. Many of the fads that we see in today's churches, even supposedly Bible-believing churches, or those, those who claim they're Bible-believing, are at their core heresies. They're heresies. They dilute the gospel. They, soften, they make it softer. Remember what I said about being in a war? It's really hard to be soft. It's really hard to be soft. They dilute the gospel. They shade, they throw shade on the divinity of Christ. Well, not, you know, he's, yeah, he's God, but. They cast out. This is Satan's original trick, by the way. This is Satan's original success. They cast doubt on the authority and the sufficiency of Scripture. They, they, they dilute or they, they make you doubt the Word of God. That's what he did to Adam and Eve. He made Adam and Eve d d not believe or to doubt God's Word. And look at the mess we're in because of it. He hasn't changed much either. And many of these heresies, many of these fads sound so good. We want to believe them. We want to believe them. Your fellow believers, the members of your church, your friends, the people who are sitting around you, folks, are the one to whom the Holy Spirit uses to, you, the Holy Spirit uses to say, nope. Nope. This is the way. And you'll find the truth in these scriptures. Holy Spirit uses you, members one of another, to bring the to, to defend the truth of the gospel. Now, once again, I could probably take all those eight responsibilities, unpack them each, you know, over four or five weeks. Not going to happen. Not today. But I do want to land on one very important point. I just kind of want to land on this one. Community. Community. We are a community. As believers in the Lord Jesus, we have been summoned to gather, to assemble in his house. That's our ecclesia. We have been summoned. We are the summoned. We are the called to gather in his house. He has prepared a meal for us. Around his table. Around his table. We call it communion because it comes from the same root word as community. We're in community with God the Father.
Now we're gonna have we're gonna have community in a few minutes, but I, I do want to I just want to spa spend a few more words on it bef before we go there. Before Bruce comes up and he and I will serve you com communion. <coughs> I will I will mention <coughs> excuse me when Bruce and I are serving that. Uh, for those of you who are still a little nervous taking from a, from a common plate, we have a, a few um, uh, Dixie cups with uh, the bread in it. We'll serve you the, we'll, we'll serve you the, uh, the, the uh, grape juice. But, so when we're serving, you can come up and get it if you, don't want to be, if you don't want us to serve you. But Paul is very clear. Okay, let's just get coming back to the idea of communion. The Lord's Supper, uh, I just don't want to go through the motions here. Because I think there's a there's a really important we, we when 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 we have communion most of the time we go into First Corinthians eleven and we use the words <clears throat> that Paul gave us and we stop there. But right after that, right after those words, there's this. Okay, there's where's, there's this. Um, you know, we proclaim the Lord's death until we come. That's the end. And this is verse, 1 Corinthians eleven twenty seven. Whoever, therefore, eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself, herself, then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Consider yourselves, break, then eat and, break, and drink. If anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks, you know, any, anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That's why so many of you are weak and ill and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. Pretty stark warning, huh? So as Bruce and I distribute communion, please take heed of, what, of Paul's warning. Please take heed of what he's saying. Ask him, ask, ask, ask the Holy Spirit, what idols are in my heart that you're trying to expose so that, so that I can repent and deal? What are they? What are they? What attitudes of pride and entitlement are you harboring? What angers and what, not, what what's, you know, what's on your mind? Confess your sins to God for him first. <clears throat> then ask who in this ecclesia, this gathering of summoned saints, would be willing to walk beside me with my struggles? Consider all this. Then serve one another in love, as he served us by taking the righteous punishment for our sins on the cross. I read the warning. Here are the words that precede it, the ones that are familiar. <clears throat> For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. John, if you want to start coming up, your group. Lord Jesus, let's pray. Lord Jesus, you have summoned us to be your church in this place. You have put us together, put together this local church, your body here, exactly as you wish, and you continue to mold us into your image. May we, the First Congregational Church of Barrington, be a blessing to you. 
to each other, to the area around Barrington, and to the world as we live out your love for us. Amen.